So welcome everybody. I uh, hope everyone's having a good Christmas season so far. Um, today, uh, what I want to talk about is something that happened or something that was revealed on December 4th. Uh, there was uh, anybody seeing the news, one of the latest archaeological finds? What was found was one of the seals, actually the seal of Hezekiah. Okay. Uh, we've had other evidences to support Ezekiah, but this was kind of a huge one because it, it, it nails him. I mean, it's like there's no question about it. This was his actual official seal. And there were symbols of, there was a, 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 a wing and two symbols that indicate life. And it's kind of important because Hezekiah was one of the major good kings in the Old Testament. Anybody know what prophet served at the time of Hezekiah? Who was the prophet of the Lord when Hezekiah reigned? You have to cheat and look it up. <laughs> well, I, I can tell you. <laughs> okay. That would be Isaiah. Okay. 700, around 700, 750 B.C. And this is kind of a big deal because this particular king, this is like finding... Moses's staff in a sense because the second largest miracles outside of Moses if you take a look at the miracles of the Old Testament outside of Genesis outside of Moses the king under Hezekiah those were the most huge miracles that God did and it's interesting that it was Isaiah was the prophet that was the herald of these fantastic miracles back around 690 BC a big event occurred. That event was the death of the king of Assyria. Assyria was the world power. They ruthlessly ruled the world and they used their army as, like the mafia. And every major country had to pay tribute to them. That was the deal. If you're the biggest, baddest country, then anybody under you, you could go there and say, hey, we want so much gold, give it or else. And everybody paid because they feared Assyria. Syria was bad news. I mean, when they captured you, they didn't throw you in jail. They were very good at torture and mutilation, and they literally had walls of heads from, from people that had resisted them in their city, walls of skulls from people that had resisted them. So they commanded that. When Jonah was instructed to go to Nineveh, his answer was, no, I'm not going there. I want you to destroy those guys. They're like totally wicked, man, okay? They hack people's heads off. They torture people. They peel people's skin off. I mean, they are a vicious, horrible people. So no. And ultimately, you know what happened with that. So anyway, everybody has to pay money. So the king dies. And so three kings got together and said, you know what, maybe we should stop paying because the king is dead. Ding dong, okay, he's dead. And so Egypt and Ethiopia and Judah said, we're going to stop paying tribute. Now, who was king of Judah at this time? Hezekiah. He got in on it and says, you know what, you guys, you're right. We shouldn't pay anymore because he's dead. That era is over. Well, the king's young son went by the name of Sennacherib. And Sennacherib felt snubbed, and he decided to show everybody that he was just as bad as daddy was. So he got his, he got his forces together and decided to go attack. And so he marched his people over into Egypt and did a number on the Egyptians. He put the Egyptians in their place. Assyria beat the Egyptians, and there are records all over. There are several uh, records which indicate that this battle occurred and Egypt didn't hold out against Assyria. And so they marched from there toward, um, toward Israel. And they took many Israeli cities. The main city that they took was Lachish. And I say the main city because the Assyrians were very proud of what they did to the people of Lachish. They tortured them. They actually made monuments to the destruction of Lachish. That, you can, that, were, that were in, in Assyria. Let me turn this down. Okay? So what happened was the reason they were so brutal 
toward the people of Lachish was that Lachish was kind of up on a little raised area. And so when the Assyrians came to the city, they rained arrows down on them. They had the height advantage. So when they finally took Lachish, they, they took out their wrath on them by, by flaying the men alive, by peeling their skin off. And they actually hear a base relief um, base relief models of what they did to the people of Lachish in Assyria. This is in the British Museum, by the way. Okay, um, they put them on. They put they put them on spikes. They peeled their skin off and they made a monument. Now this is they're on their way to Jerusalem, where Hezekiah is, and their that their intention is to take to to basically to decimate all of Israel, all of Judah. So they're on their way. So this, um, this basically, this is just a comment saying that they were extremely severe. They, their punishments included dismemberment, cutting off limbs, ears, nose, lips, castration, impalement on a stake, uh, hard labor, uh, flaying alive, blinded, cutting your tongues out. These are all, these are all tools that the Assyrians, Assyrians use to enforce terror. And so this is a base relief that they showed, again, from the people of Lachish, uh, poking somebody's eyes out, you know, grabbing their tongue, pulling them forward while they stab a spear in the eye, or hot pokers. Here they are impaling people on sticks, and they were proud of it. I mean, they actually made artwork to what they, you know, you know, uh, you know immortalizing what they did to their enemies. As I mentioned, Jonah, not Noah, this is Jonah. <laughs> Jonah did not want to go talk to these guys because they were so brutal and they had such a, a, a terrible record. Okay, now so I'll start reading in King, now the, the the story of this attack on Judah is rep, is repeated several places in the Bible. It's discussed in the Book of Isaiah. It's discussed in Kings. It's also discussed in uh, in Chronicles. So we have multiple records of this. Now I should say that this attack is not just mentioned in the Bible. It's also mentioned in Assyrian records. It's also me mentioned in some Egyptian records. Okay, and so we have multiple sources describing this very same event. So the most detailed account, I believe, is in 2 Kings. King Hezekiah sent a message to the king of Assyria at his headquarters in Lachish. I've done wrong. I admit it. Pull back your army. I'll pay whatever tribute you set. So here's the picture. The Assyrians are attacking Lachish, wiping people out and peeling people's skin off, and word reaches Hezekiah. They've crossed the borders, they're in Israel, they're on their way to Jerusalem, and this is what they're doing to the people of Lachish. Hezekiah is thinking, you know what? I wish I'd have paid them taxes. Okay? He's regretting his decision very much at this time because he sees what's going on. And he's looking at, oh my goodness, Everybody here is going to die. I'm going to get my eyes poked out. This is a really bad situation. And so now he's begging. He's begging the Assyrians, please, I admit it, I totally messed up. That's, up. That's my bad, my bad. I'm ready to pay. You want taxes? I'm ready to pay those taxes now. Okay, that's, that's, that's Hezekiah's mindset at this time. The king of Assyria demanded tribute from Hezekiah, king of Judah. 11 tons of silver and a ton of gold. 11 tons of silver and a ton of gold. Now this is, I think around 650 BC. Um, this is just up until 1000 BC. Silver was worth twice as much as gold. But this is, it's changed now because people have realized that gold is more rare. And so that's why you see this disparity. So 11 tons of silver and a ton of gold. Hezekiah turned over all the silver he could find in the temple of God and in the palace the treasuries. Hezekiah even took down the doors of the temple of God and the door, doorpost that he had overlaid with gold and gave them to the king of Assyria. He says, you want gold? I'll give you all the gold I have. Just don't come in here and do what you did to the people of Lachish. So the king of Assyria sent his, three t his top three military chiefs from Lachish with a strong military force to King Hezekiah in Jerusalem. The third officer, uh, Rabshakeh, was spokesman. He said, tell Hezekiah a message from the great king, the king of Assyria. You're living in a world of make-believe, of pious fantasy. Do you think that mere words are any substitute for military strategy and troops? 
Now that you've revolted against me, who can you expect to help you? You thought Egypt would, but Egypt's nothing but a paper tiger. One puff of wind and she collapses. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, is nothing but bluff and bluster. So I say, you guys got together in your little alliance and decided, whoa, if they come at us, we're going to get together and fight back. Really? Your allies are already finished. There's nobody to help you. And so, you know, I want a little bit more than gold. You actually thought you could stand up to us? What were you thinking? Or are you going to tell me we rely on God? So the first, the first ally he goes after is Egypt. Now he says, oh, so you thought, what, God was going to help you? Seriously. Now, keep in mind, one of the differences between Israel and the rest of the world was everybody else was really falling, it was, was they, they were polytheistic. One of the chief deities all over the place at this time was Baal Hadad. Baal Hadad was the big god. You know, everybody called him Baal, but actually Baal was short for Baal Hadad, okay? And his sisters, his wicked, evil sisters, okay? Um, Anath and, Ash, and, Asher, and Ashereth, okay? And those were the main ones. Now, now, there's also Asherah, which was supposed to be, see, everybody worshiped El. Yeah, yeah, everybody worshiped El which was the chief deity and the, and, the, and the big daddy god. But the rest of the world acknowledged his wife, Asherah, who in the book of Genesis was the tree of life. It's really messed up, but that's, that's, that was everyone else. So they had altars to El and Asherah, El and Asherah, okay? But the Israelites, they didn't know Asherah. No, 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 God, no. The, the, the bad kings would bring the Asherah poles back, but the good kings destroyed all that so that there's only... El. There's only El Shaddai, Elohim, okay, uh, the, you know, the, 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 is, the, is there a supreme God. So he says, you're going to tell me we rely on God. When Hezekiah heard it all, he too, ripped, he too ripped his robes apart and dressed himself in rough burlap. Then he went into the temple of God. He sent Eliakim to the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos. They said to him, a message from Hezekiah. This is a black day, a terrible day, doomsday. Maybe God, your God, has been listening to the blasphemous speech of Reb Shekha, who was sent by the king of Assyria, his master, to humiliate the living God. Maybe God, your God, won't let him get by with such talk. And you, maybe you will lift up prayers for what is left of these people. That's the message King Hezekiah's servants delivered to Isaiah. Now, notice he's very humble. He's not, he's not doing like Ahaz, his father. He's not doing like Ahab, where he's angry at God. You know, what's wrong with God in the screen? Why doesn't he do it? No, he did not. He was very humble. Maybe if you want to, please. Very humble. Now, how did Isaiah know that the letter was from Hezekiah? The seal. Exactly. A little wax thing, it was closed, Psst. and the seal told, told Isaiah that this is a letter from Hezekiah. Isaiah answered them, tell your master God's word, thus saith the Lord. Don't be at all concerned about what you've heard from the king of Assyria's bootlick and errand boys, these outrageous blasphemies. Then Sennacherib heard that Tirakah, king of Cush, was on his way to fight against him. So he sent another envoy with orders to deliver this message to Hezekiah, king of Judah. Don't let that God you think so much of keep stringing you along with the line, Jerusalem will never fall into the king of Assyria. That's a barefaced lie. You know the track record of the kings of Assyria. Country after country laid waste, devastated. And what makes you think you'll be an exception? Take a good look at these wasted nations, destroyed by my ancestors. Did their gods do them any good? Look at Gozan, Haran, Rezeph, the people of Eden at Tel Aser, ruins. And what's left of the king of Hamath, the, the king of Arpad, the king of Seraphim, and Hena, and Iva, bones. Hezekiah took the letter from the envoy and read it. He went to the temple of God and spread it out before God. And Hezekiah prayed. Oh, how he prayed. God, God of Israel, seated in majesty on the cherubim throne, you are the one and only God, sovereign over all kingdoms on earth, maker of heaven, maker of earth. Open your ears, God, and listen. 
Open your eyes and look. Look at this letter Sennacherib has sent, a brazen insult to the living God. All right, now, this, is, this, is, this, this strategy, I think, is really important. I think it's one of, the, one, of the, one of the most important parts of the story. Very often in our lives, we face consequences. We face threat, scary stuff. Sometimes it's because of things that are our fault, because of things we were supposed to do that didn't, things that we did that we shouldn't, okay? It is not unusual. And again, we also face threats from the outside um, because we try to stand up for what is right. We face threats as well. Around the world, there's a lot of persecution of Christians, especially in Muslim nations now. Okay? Uh, it's, it's, it can be a pretty scary place. And then sometimes, even though when we do something that might be wrong, the consequences can be more severe because the enemy hates us. And the non-Christians in our environment work for the enemy, and so sometimes people don't like you, and they don't know why they don't like you. And the reason they don't like you is because the thing that's in, him, in them hates the thing that's in you, and they don't know. They don't know why they have such venom for what we stand for. Fortunately, we're not alone. And one of the ways, when we face those circumstances, when we face loss and pain and shame, when we face those, God wants us to come to him like, like Hezekiah. Put those threats out there and say, God, I'm giving this to you. You fight my battles. Help me to fight this in a way that honors you, but you're in this race and I need help from you. And that's what Hezekiah did. He humbled himself and asked God in that way for, for help. Okay? And he was completely desperate and he completely emptied himself when he made that plea. And the result, and so it happened that the very night, that that very night, an angel of the Lord came and massacred 185,000 Assyrians. When the people of Jerusalem got up the next morning, there was a whole camp of corpses. Now this is really interesting because this is not just repeated in the Bible. It's in two other historical sources, this very event. This really happened. The Assyrians came through, they started with Egypt, and then they went into Jerusalem. They laid waste to many cities in Jerusalem when they got to, sorry, in Israel, they laid waste to many cities in Israel. When they got to Jerusalem, they could not get into the city. All right, and they, so they were there for many days. Now the reason, now, and the, there's the other book, I didn't, Kings doesn't have it, but the other book in Chronicles, they discuss what happened is that prior to getting there, when they were on their way, I, uh, um, um, uh, Hezekiah had a second wall built around the city for extra fortifications. He also stopped the, uh, the, the stream that flowed into the, into the plains outside of the city. He dammed it up and, and forced it into cisterns in Israel so there'd be no water for the enemy to drink when they were camped outside. And so, that's the, and so they, they, they prepared for a long siege, but then they died. You know, so they, they, were, they, were, they were not going to give up. So while they were out there, they, they died one night. And they said the angel of the Lord. And so what, what mechanism did the angel of the Lord use? We don't know. Um, but they, all, you know, what we know is that the next morning, 185,000 corpses were out there. Now, um, this is called the, the Taylor Prism, and it contains the records of the kingdom of Sennacherib. So these, this is actually found, this was in Assyria, and it describes the event. And here's, the, the Assyrian accounts don't treat it as a disaster, but a great victory. They don't tell about the final outcome. They maintain that the siege was so successful that Hezekiah was forced to give a monetary tribute, and so the Assyrians left uh, victoriously. In the Taylor Prism here, Sennacherib states that he shut up Hezekiah the Judahite within Jerusalem, his own royal city, like a caged bird. So he put a spin on it. Okay, he put, he put a little spin on it. He says, you know what, we still won, even though I lost 185,000 people. They don't mention that loss, by the way. They don't mention that we lost 185,000 people. We went through, we beat all these Israelite cities, and instead of, they, they don't say that they, 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 they they captured Jerusalem. They say, we caged him up there. We made him, we made him stay in his city. 
and that's, that's, uh, that, was, that was their record of what happened. But um, Sennacherib was not too popular after this great loss, by the way. Uh, one of his sons killed him afterwards. And so, I mean, he was, he, he was very unpopular after this tremendous loss because, again, he lost 185,000 troops. Okay, uh, Herodotus, the father of ancient Greek history, suggests that Sennacherib's fighting force in Egypt, uh, remember, he went to Egypt first, and he su suggested that his fighting force was reduced when one night a plague of field mice gnawed the quivers, bowstrings, and shield straps of his soldiers, thus making them suddenly vulnerable to their enemies. That was their excuse for what happened. You know, it must have been so field mice that did that. But what's interesting is that reference to this calamity takes place in other, in other, in other writings. Okay? Josephus quotes from the Chaldean historian Berossus. So, uh, and he basically said, now when Sennacherib was returning from his Egyptian war to Jerusalem, he found his army in danger by a plague, for God had sent a pestilential distemper upon his army. And on the very night of the siege, 104 score and 5,000, which is 185,000, with their captains and generals were destroyed. And so we have, again, multiple sources for this particular event. Now, afterwards, um, the, the problem is, is that after all this happened, you'd think that, that Hezekiah would be totally, <clears throat> totally humble for the rest of his life. <clears throat> well, he was human, and uh, he, he wasn't. Um, he got kind of a big head after that, like, wow, you know, look what, look what we did. Because it was God and I worked together on this project, right? Because, you know, with his, because he, we had this, we built this aqueduct, and we saved our city, we, we fortified the walls, and so it was kind of a joint effort. And so afterwards, he fell ill, and um, the Hezekiah came and said, okay, I'm just going to read this, chapter 20. About that time, Hezekiah became deathly ill. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to visit him. He gave the king this message. This is what the Lord says. Set your affairs in order, for you're going to die. You will not recover from this illness. Okay, now... That's bad news, obviously. When Hezekiah heard this, he turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Remember, O Lord, how I've always been faithful to you and have served you single-mindedly, always doing what pleases you. Then he broke down and wept bitterly. Okay. But before Isaiah had left the middle courtyard, this message came to him from the Lord. Go back to Hezekiah, the leader of my people. Tell him. This is what the Lord, the God of your ancestor David says, I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will heal you. And three days from now, you will get out of bed and go to the temple of the Lord. I will add 15 years to your life and I will rescue you and this city from the king of Assyria. I will defend this city for my own honor and for the sake of my servant David. Then Isaiah said, make an ointment from figs. So Hezekiah's servant spread the ointment over the boil and Hezekiah recovered. Now, this is an interesting story, okay? Because it's, it's like, okay, God says, that's it. You're done. You're going to die from this. And so he cries, Lord, please, please, please. And then God says, okay, all right, you're still going to die. <laughs> but 15 years from now, okay? And he lived another 15 years. Now, the, what's interesting here is that about this particular story is that that, you know, we, we believe that's probably the seal of Hezekiah is unlike any other seals. We have other seals from other kings. We have, we have, we have Ahaz's seal. We have, we have even, um, the, we've even found Jezebel's seal. That's been discovered, okay? No other seals have symbols for life on them. Hezekiah's seal had symbols for life. And it's interesting, we probably, I mean, logically, it's because of this particular event, because he was saved, he was saved from um, the, 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 the Assyrians, and he was saved from his own, he was saved from that, saved from death himself. Okay, so I have a video clip describing the discovery of that seal now, so I'm just going to quickly go through that. Many of the stories of the Bible are about the people of Israel and Judah and their kings. The modern mind, rarely reading these accounts, easily assumes that the Bible is merely a religious text, that its purpose is to influence pious behavior, not to establish historical fact. But every now and again, 
the dust of Jerusalem stirs. Those who dig down to the past unearth one layer after another. And as they do, the events and people of the Bible spring to life. A new discovery has emerged from the soil of Jerusalem, and it resurrects the history of one of the most important kings in Judah. After him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, the Bible says, nor any that were before him. You can find the name of this particular king in the books of Kings, Chronicles, and Isaiah, and also on this tiny clay seal impression known as a bulla. It says, belonging to Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah. Dr. Elat Mazar and her team discovered this extraordinary artifact during a recent phase of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem Ophel excavations. In archaeological excavations we conducted in the Ophel area, we found a most unique item, that is the private seal impression of King Hezekiah. This is the first time that such an item is found ever in archaeological excavations. It, this is so tiny, it's just one centimeter, and it was found during the wet sifting. Uh, it's a system that makes it possible for such an item to be revealed, otherwise it so easily gets lost. And we can see very easily the name of King Hezekiah, the symbol that he chose to put on his seal impression with the sun disk with wings and symbol of life on both sides of the wings. And uh, of course, this is a seal, private seal of the king that most likely held by the king and by nobody else. And we found it. We found it in a royal quarter. That means that we get as close as possible, tangible, as ever to King Hezekiah himself. Of course, one of the most important figures in the Bible, King Hezekiah, known from Assyrian documents. Of course, he is well known from the Bible itself. And now we get to touch him as close as we can get uh, by the archeological evidence that was found in the uh, excavations themselves conducted for many years at the Ophel site. Archaeological digs on the Ophel have occurred on and off since the middle of the 19th century. But only in recent years have royal structures and royal artifacts been uncovered in Jerusalem that closely correlate to the biblical descriptions found in the books of Kings and Chronicles. I'm walking into the royal building that we revealed back in 1986 and prepared for the public after our excavations in 2009. You can see that this building is beautifully preserved. It was built at the time of King Solomon and used until the end of the first temple period, meaning destroyed by, by the Babylonians at 586 BCE. We found a destruction layer and all these jars that you can see here, including an ancient Hebrew inscription on one of the jars, which indicate that they were used by the uh, official who is in charge of the bakery at the royal house. From this building, all the bullae and garbage that were thrown from the windows of the second floor. And all this garbage, we found it as the, it was dumped from on to the other side of the building. That's where we found many bulai, among which are our bulai. So when the material uh, come back from uh, sifting, we, we make a list for, uh, of all the names that we have in the bulai. And one of the bulai was this one. We read in the initial uh, reading, Lechizkiyahu, Malkiyahu. And the, there was a more letter that we didn't understood, but we left it uh, for later. So after some years, when we concluded the first volume of the publication of uh, the awful excavation, we start again and we saw that there is a dot between the letters of the name Melchiao. So it's not the name of Melchiao, it's the word Melech and Yehu. And the meaning is Yehuda. And then we, we come back to the letters that had missed and 
we understood that uh, there was the name of Hezekiah's father, Ahaz. So in the seal that uh, pressed this bulla, there was the letters Lehizkiyahu Ahaz Melech Yehuda. So this is a royal bulla. 14 generations after King David, Hezekiah ascended to the Davidic throne in Jerusalem. The northern kingdom Israel had just been conquered. In the southern kingdom, young King Hezekiah started his reign by purging Judah of pagan religious customs. Later on, the Bible says, Hezekiah rebelled against the king of Assyria and served him not. The Assyrian king, Sennacherib, came against Judah and conquered many of its cities. This is recounted in 2 Kings 18 and Isaiah 36. It's also recorded on the annals of Sennacherib. Regarding Sennacherib's invasion of Judah, one prism on display at the British Museum says, As for Hezekiah the Judahite, who did not submit to my yoke, 46 of his strong walled cities I besieged and took them. Hezekiah himself, like a caged bird, I shut up in Jerusalem, his royal city. Sennacherib considered the takeover of one Judean city, Lachish, to be so important that he had the conquest portrayed on large wall reliefs at his palace in Nineveh. Today, many of these well-preserved reliefs are also on display at the British Museum. After Lachish, Sennacherib's plan was to lay siege against Jerusalem. Anticipating the attack, Hezekiah famously cut a 1,700-foot underground tunnel to deliver fresh spring water into the city. Today, this conduit is one of Jerusalem's most popular tourist attractions. It's an engineering marvel that is referred to in both the books of Kings and Chronicles and it was carved through bedrock to protect against an Assyrian siege that did not succeed. History and archaeology correspond with the Bible. There is no destruction layer laid down by Assyrian siege weapons. There are no reliefs of a Jerusalem conquest along the palace walls in Nineveh. The siege against Jerusalem failed. The Assyrian army withdrew and its king, Sennacherib, was later murdered by one of his sons. Hezekiah and his kingdom lived on. Rarely do science and the Bible converge as dramatically and as tangibly as with the life and work of King Hezekiah of Judah. Dr. Elat Mazar's most recent discovery is barely the size of your fingertip, but it contains a message of enormous significance. It bears the name of one of the greatest leaders in Jerusalem's incomparable history. Belonging to Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah. The full story and significance of the Hezekiah Bulla is published in the Ophel Excavations Final Report, Volume 1, published in December 2015. This is, this is, why is, why this time? Because we're close to Christmas and the question is, what does this have to do with Christmas? This bulla, this seal dates to the time of Hezekiah, which means when this was around, Isaiah the prophet was still alive and kicking. Isaiah the prophet, the prophecies, he prophesied that Assyria would be defeated. He told Hezekiah not to worry because God was going to take care of things, and God did. God saved. God, he said God would save, and God saved. God saved Judah, and God saved Hezekiah's life. He gave him another 15 years. Isaiah saw it coming, and he accurately predicted it. Isaiah saw some other things coming. In Isaiah chapter 9, 
He's, and I'm sorry, not Isaiah. Yeah, Isaiah chapter 9. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in the land of deep darkness, a light will shine. You will enlarge the nation of Israel, and its people will rejoice. They will rejoice before you as people rejoice at, at the harvest, like warriors dividing the plunder. For you will break the yoke of their slavery and lift the heavy burden from their shoulders. You will break the oppressor's rod, just as you did when you destroyed the army of Midian. The boots of the warrior and the uniforms of the bloodstained uh, 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 by war will all be burned. They will be fuel for the fire. For a child is born to us, a son is given, the government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government will be its peace. I'm sorry. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make it happen. Okay. That was predicted. Now, this was written, actually, before all that stuff we just saw. This is one of Isaiah's earlier prophecies. This was written when Ahaz, Hezekiah's father, was, who was one of the wicked kings. But Isaiah predicted that. Now, think what he's saying. He's going to enlarge the nation of Israel. He's talking about bringing other people into the fold of believers. This is clearly a reference to the Messiah. Now, what's more astounding is Isaiah 53. Okay, because that is so specific. I'm going to quickly read through it, just very quick. <clears throat> the servant grew up before God, a scrawny seedling, a scrubby plant in a parched field. There was nothing attractive about him, nothing to cause us to say, take a second look. He was looked down on and passed over, a man who suffered, who knew pain firsthand. And one look at him and people turned away. We looked down on him, thought he was scum. But the fact is, it was our pains he carried, our disfigurements, all the things wrong with us. We thought he brought it on himself, that God was punishing him for his own failures. But it was our sins that did that to him, that ripped and tore and crushed him, our sins. He took the punishment and that, that made us whole. Through his bruises, we get healed. We're all like sheep who've wandered off and gotten lost. We've all done our own thing, gone our own way. And God has piled all our sins, everything we've done wrong, on him, on him. He was beaten. He was tortured, but he didn't say a word. Like a lamb taken to be slaughtered and like a sheep being sheared, he took it all in silence. Justice miscarried, and he was let off, and, he, and, and did Anyone really know what was happening? He died without a thought for his own welfare, beaten, bloody for the sins of my people. They buried him with the wicked, threw him in a grave with a rich man, even though he'd never heard a soul or, one, or said one word that wasn't true. Still, it's what God had in mind all along, to crush him with pain. The plan was that he gave himself as an offering for sin, so that he'd see life come from it. Life, life, and more life. And God's plan will deeply prosper through him. Out of that terrible travail of soul, he'll see that it's worth it and be glad he did it. Through what he experienced, my righteous one, my servant, will make many righteous ones. And he himself carries off the burden of their sins. Therefore, I'll reward him extravagantly. The best of everything, the highest honors. Because he looked death in the face and didn't flinch. Because he embraced the company of the lowest. He took it on his own shoulders. The sin of many. He took up the cause of all the black sheep. Now when you read that, you go, well, this is so obviously a reference to Jesus Christ. And before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the liberal scholars were claiming that this was added by zealous Christians after the fact. They were convinced that that was put into Isaiah, into the copies of Isaiah after Jesus. Because at that time, we didn't have copies that predated Christ. Okay? And so they were totally convinced that this was a fabrication. There's no way Isaiah could have predicted this. And when the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, did they offer an apology and say, oops, our bad? No. No, they did not. Okay, silence. Silence. This was Isaiah's prophecy. Extremely, extremely an accurate portrayal of the coming and death of Jesus Christ. 
So anyway, so is, is this a loose association? <laughs> I don't think, it just feels like, wow, this is really cool. We have a relic from the time of the prophet that accurately predicted a historical event, the, the rescue of Judah by God and, the, and, and King Hezekiah. And now we have it early. We have other prophecies by that same prophet that came true. And it just, it, it just I don't know, it, it, it adds something to the Christmas season, I think. Okay?